recorded. Um, so a very warm welcome to Mark and Paul. Mark, if you want to share your screen, you can go ahead. Hello, everybody. Uh, and firstly, thanks to the guys for inviting me along today to be part of this talk, uh, which I find very interesting. And, and it, it formed, um, engineering formed a very important part of my success as an athlete. But again, as may have said at the, at the outset, also for giving me independence after I suffered a spinal injury just nearly 20 years ago. So I suppose I'm just going to talk for the next 20 minutes about um, my early life and how uh, I developed it as an athlete. And then after my accident, how engineering, I suppose, and how my previous life helped me cope and adapt and overcome situations that I occurred as, as I progressed through life. So I'm going to do it, guys, through video and some slides. Um, and I'm going to try my best to be as IT savvy as possible. So I'm going to start off, guys, with, with a short video that was done. Uh, that gives just an introduction um, about myself. If I can just get the link. Uh, oh, one second. Just switch screens here. And I will change screen to here. Can you see the video there now? Can you hear me, Amit? I can hear you, yeah. There's no video yet, though. I'm lying in a ditch. I'm not exactly sure where I am. I'm drifting in and out of consciousness. Yeah, that's good. I can hear my phone ringing, but I can't get to it. I can hear cars pass me by. They can't see me. I'm unsure what's going to happen to me. I was always crazy about sport. I played soccer, Gaelic football, hurling, handball, whatever sport was taking place outside. I was usually in the middle of it. I was on the way to a soccer match and I'd lost control of the motorcycle and I'd hit the ditch and I hit a tree. The bike landed about 40 yards up from where I had gone into the ditch. And the way it landed, people actually thought that the bike was left there. An hour and a half passed until one guy decided to walk the ditch to make sure there was nobody in it. And luckily enough, he did because he found me lying in it and probably wouldn't be alive without him stopping. As a result of hitting the tree, I had broken four bones in my back, which damaged my spinal cord. I had broken four ribs, I broke my breastbone, my collarbone, I tore my aorta, I punctured a lung. I had four compound fractures in my right foot and a fractures in my left foot. The first time I remember meeting a doctor was when he was there with his junior doctors visiting in the morning. And one of them had asked him about operating on my foot. And he had said, no, there's no point. He, you know, he's not going to need it, more or less. So that was the first time that it hit home that I was paralyzed. As soon as I got on the bike the very first day, I fell in love with it. The whole sense of being outside in the fresh air, working hard, and the sense of speed was a massive draw for me, and it gave me a great sense of freedom. Late 2010 is when the focus really started, and Paralympics Ireland came on board. When you're focused towards London, it's 24-7, 365. The first race for me was on uh, the 5th of September. And I remember waking up that morning and it was the first time I was ever nervous about an event and I couldn't eat my breakfast. So I just wanted to get on my bike, get the warm up done. And once I started that, I knew I was in good shape. The race itself, after one lap, I was 20 seconds up and halfway through the second lap, I was 10 seconds down. And I ended up winning by 11 seconds. So it was a great sense of relief to get that first gold medal. Now, I always believed that I would reach the top of whatever sport I played before my accident and after my accident. But I never imagined that it would lead me to represent Ireland around the world, uh, to winning world championships and then to be lucky enough to win two gold medals at the London Games.
I'd have to find where I put um, the desktop guy, sorry. Uh, that was great. It, it showed there for a second, Mark. There's no video showing now, right? No, just just yourself. World champion runner out, Lionel Sanders. Can you hear me, guys? Yeah. Okay, let me see what screen is being shared now. It's just the video of you for now. Okay. Uh, here we go. Sorry about that. And now can we see the PowerPoint? Yep, it's showing good. Okay. Sorry about this, guys. This is all, this is all new to me. Uh, okay. So we can see the introduction page, is that right? Yeah, that's good. Yes, okay, guys. So that's a small bit about me. Uh, gives you a bit of background um, how I came, came to be here today. Uh, and I suppose um, I'm just going to go through four or five different things that I think I've learned along the way and I had picked up from people before I had the accident and things that stood me in good stead over the last 20 years when I was uh, rehabbing uh, and taking on new challenges. And so as the video was talking about there, yeah, probably the, one of the most important things is luck. Um, well, I was very lucky that a guy actually found me in the ditch. It just happened that he was driving on the road and he was uh, he worked for the Farm Relief Services and he'd seen the, the, the motorcycle. And um, he was just, because I'd been in the ditch for an hour and a half and cars had passed by and it was, it was the 4th of November, so it was very cold. And he happened because he was he was teaching first aid on, on farms and teaching them to farmers and stuff. And he saw the bike and he thought it was a bit strange. So he stopped and he walked the road to find me in the ditch. And he saved my life, basically, to be honest. Um, so from that that time, I knew I was lucky. I, and I also, I, I felt lucky anyway, growing up. I was very aware of my surroundings. I grew up in a village called Banglahoun. I'd gone to school in the Maris College in Athlone. I'd played Gaelic football for that school and went on to play for my club and county, West Mead. And then I had a job I loved. I was working as an apprentice electrician uh, with the ESB. So I was out and about meeting people in a full active job. And all of my surroundings and everything was active outside life. I, I come from a farming background as well. So if you weren't playing sport, you were probably milking or you were work I, My uncle had a farm feed store. So we'd be doing deliveries at weekends, in the evenings. So it was very physical, everything I did. So to end up in a wheelchair, of course, you could look at it in one aspect and say that... Uh, you could focus on the ne negative side of it. Uh, and you could say all the things I was going to miss out on that I was used to. But I decided not to. I decided to look on it a different way and say, okay, I'll be, I've been very lucky to survive what just happened. And quickly I made up my mind that I was going to use all of my resources that I had learned, especially through sport, um, to help me rehab. Because initially I had spent, I had spent the first 12 weeks with a, a plaster Paris cast because they couldn't operate on my, on my spine at the time because of internal damage. And I had spent 12 weeks in the plaster Paris. Um, so you're very restricted. And I was in intensive care for nearly two months. So you've a lot of time to think. And of course, there's people coming in and out and telling you everything's gonna be fine and uh, all the best intentions, but reality, you're stuck there looking at the ceiling. Uh, and at the start, when you have a spinal injury, they keep you on a bed um, a splint. So you spend six hours at the ceiling and then they turn you over, they put another bed on top and they turn you over uh, because they don't want the skin pressure to break down, the skin to break down through pressure. Um, and there was no, I know it's 20 years ago, but there was no iPads, uh, iPhones. I remember I had a Nokia 5610, I think, in my pocket um, when, I, when I did crash. And I think I broke a couple of ribs. It was that big and bulky. It had damaged me, my uh, my rib cage, so I had a lot of time to um, think. And I thought, okay, how can I, how can I how can I get back and get out of here as soon as possible? Uh, so I had a mental uh, positive mental response to it uh, because I knew that hard work. I come from a hard working family background. That hard work is the main recipe for success. And through the rehabilitation, of the hospital, there's some wonderful people in Dunleary. Uh, 
they start to show you that actually you can live a normal life. So through physio, through occupational therapy, uh, and through engineering, through wheelchairs, through electric doors, through uh, adaptable cars, automatic cars. So, so engineering really has given me an independent life. So uh, it's very apt that I'm talking uh, about the benefits of sport and engineering, because when you do suffer a mobility impairment, um, it's that different view or that ability to think outside the box or to create something new that can change your life. What I, what I found changed my life was sport. Again, it helped me rebuild, helped me reconnect with other people, uh, helped me build confidence to become independent, to travel, to have the appetite to learn. Um, but it took a while. So look was definitely one of the most important parts because it depends on your injury too, how adaptable you can become to the, to the world that we live in and how it's constructed. And I was lucky, I, I got to, I'm paralyzed from the, just below the chest. So I got to keep my arms, which is a big thing. And I, I learned pretty quickly that I have to stay fit and active to be independent. Um, of course, when you're faced with a spinal injury, you're in a wheelchair. And no matter how you prepare yourself for it, when you do re-enter the real world, it's a shock because you're looked at differently. Automatically, people notice it. Uh, so there's, all, there's, a stigma, uh, uh, there's a stigma around people in wheelchairs, uh, but not just, not just um, a social stigma, but physical barriers all the time in a wheelchair. So you can get down and you can say, okay, how can I get about it? But one of the biggest things I found was you have to be courageous. Uh, and courage is a massive part of any project that you're doing, especially if you undertake a big project. But definitely when I was re-entering, uh, the normal world, we call it, um, because you have to relearn how to dress yourself, how to get into a wheelchair, how to move, how to get outside a house. And I was lucky that I was living in a small village and my parents had a bungalow at the time. Uh, so I was able to go and move into the bungalow. They were able to adapt the bathroom uh, and a bedroom, which was all pretty easy. But I know other, lots of other guys in the hospital had lived in townhouses in, in towns and cities around the country. Um, and that was the biggest difficulty, I suppose, just re-entering the world. But once I did start to become um, more independent, I just looked at normalizing my life again. And sport had always played an important role uh, because I knew the benefits physically, especially with the mobility issue, but also mentally. And so socially, it's how Ireland ticks, I suppose. Um, how we meet, how we, how, how the majority of the country spend their times at the weekends and it's a rugby match, talking about the Formula One, talking about the horse racing, whatever it is, there's usually sport uh, around it. And um, so I started to play basketball at the time and I had to travel to Dublin uh, up and down twice a week. And then eventually we got to start a club in Athlone. And then I progressed on to play for the Athlone club and, and then a Dublin club that competed in the UK. And then eventually uh, we got to play in the European Championship with Ireland. But because I'm from the countryside, I like to be outside and outdoors. I cross-trained with a bicycle. Um, and I bought, I, I experienced cycling a bike when I was playing a tennis competition in the UK, a wheelchair tennis competition, and had a demo, a hand cycle. And I, I tried it out and I loved it. I thought, what a great way to keep cardio fit when the basketball season is, 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 um, is finished. So I bought a bike online from America and it came. Uh, I got it the first few times I crashed it. I went out in the cold, all the wet, all the wrong mistakes to kind of light the fire of love for cycling. But I did, I loved it from the very start. Uh, and I started to become, I, at the time I was very lucky because there weren't many people hand cycling in Ireland. And um, I got to go to, I got selected for an Irish team without really, any real experience because there was only two of us in the country with hand bikes. Uh, so they invited us along the Irish Wheelchair, Irish Wheelchair Association and Cycling Ireland put a few pounds together and brought myself and a guy by the name of Carl Doherty up in Donegal uh, to the World Championships. And there I learned a really good lesson because um, that's the next point I want to talk about is what's important in life uh, is, I would say, grit. Um, and the, there's a good um, study on the Navy SEALs by a lady called, uh, I think it's called the Duckworth Method, Angela Duckworth, I think her name is. And she did, she did a study on not just the physical capabilities of Navy SEALs, 
They tested 100 of them. And the top 50 physically weren't always the ones that got through. Uh, so they're able to do a test to find out the mental toughness, we call it, of some of the guys. And they could predict, okay, they're, physically they're not as good as the top 50, but we think they will, we think they will um, last the pace. Um, so I got selected for a World Cup in Italy, a World Championships, uh, without any quality training, without any equipment, quality equipment. Oh, what the hell is happening there? Um, but when we went out there, um, we quickly realized that the bike I had was, was, uh, it was just a normal bike, uh, just a recreational leisure bike. And when we went, went to the, the uh, regulations place, they told us that we couldn't start with the bike because it had no chain guards. So we didn't even know that we had to have a safety chain guard. So my, my mechanic, the mechanic at the time was Jerry Beggs, who was a great guy. And my father came with me to give me a hand at the time. And they had to uh, do their own bit of engineering and they went down to a local uh, garden hardware store and they bought a potted, a tray for a potted plant and they cut it down the middle, spray painted it black, uh, got some cable ties and a small L bracket, put it on the bike, covered the chain ring. And then when we when I went to the start line the next day for the time trial, the guy looked at us and I, I think he kind of felt a bit sorry for us, but he, um, he allowed us to start. Uh, and that, that, that showed me as well that, that, you know, tenacity is big time important, you know, initiative, resilience. We were told we couldn't do something, but we found a way to make it happen. And we got on that start line and I finished last. I, I, got, I got on the start line. And I told uh, myself, oh, I need these tires at 120 pounds pressure. For sure, they'll, they'll roll faster. And Jerry, the mechanic said, no, Mark, 100's fine. But he said, but if you want to do it, do it yourself. And fair play to me, he knew I had to learn the lesson the hard way. So I pumped it up to 125, um, got onto the start line. And because with the arm power, your power isn't as, as strong. So you need a bigger selection of gears. So my own wheel, I had 1136. So I could really spin up, up, up a hill. And the tire blew, of course. Uh, and then Jerry quickly changed the wheel to the cycling iron wheel, which had a much smaller block, which means you have to grind much more uh, slower revs per minute. And I started the race and I finished last and my two arms nearly fell off because I had to grind my way around it. Um, and I quickly realized actually I really like this. I love the competition. I love the other bikes. So myself and my father went for the next day or two, photographing every bike there, talking to every uh, team manager talking to every athlete, how they train, where they train, what they eat, what they do. And we took, we took a lot of information from that, especially from the Germans and the Swiss. And then we tried to replicate and copy that stuff. Um, and and thank, thankfully I, was, I came along to a cycling area at the right time because it was a really good CEO at the time, uh, a really good coach um, and a really good team of people that said, okay, Mark, your, your starting point is here. We think you have potential. We're going to support you if you're interested. I got a coach, start training properly for the next two, two years, uh, and then started to become much more successful. But without the team and the, and the without, I suppose, the initiative that first time, the know-how of the guys uh, and the support and belief they had in me at the time, um, I definitely wouldn't have progressed the way I did. And then of course, like any athlete, you progress quickly and you quickly plateau. Uh, and that's where we started to do some research testing, uh, developing the aerodynamics of the bike. And if you can see this picture here, this is a carbon footplate that I made myself. Um, I copied the Swiss guy, I'd seen what he had done, took pictures and his feet put, fit perfectly into these molds. So I got, um, I got myself a contact in Tullamore Hospital. I went into the, uh, the guy who does the plaster parison asked him what he do two casts of my feet, got them made, brought them to uh, another contact I made in Dublin airport who worked with carbon and got him to make those molds. Uh, and I used them for national championships, I think 2004, yeah, 14. Um, and that was very crude and rudimentary, but it did the job. Uh, and that's when I came in touch with the guys. Um, I met Owen, Owen Clifford, uh, who is a, a, an unbelievable athlete himself, but also an amazing professional uh, who suggested that we start doing some work on, on aerodynamics and how we could improve it and did some modeling. 
I'm sure that's what Paul was involved at the time uh, and how we could improve things and, and get that extra little bit uh, that would make you faster. And thankfully, all those things worked out. You know, with the great team, we were able to deliver some really nice uh, work that has carried on through Cycling Ireland because I know Paul has worked with Declan Slevin and Tandems and everything else. So that small little ripple that we started way back in 2012, 13, 14, is continuing right up to today. Uh, so there's a massive impact you can have, like one small bit of belief can create a massive impact. And that's a massive thing, guys. I don't know uh, why I'm for time, but belief for me is massive. And like in that video, I said, I always believed I, was, I would succeed. Uh, and not, out, not out of um, arrogance, but out of knowing that there's people around me that had succeeded at the top level. And I showed these, these pictures to um, Maeve and Magda and Paul the other day. They didn't know who, who this guy was. I'm sure, um, I'll never forget the day that Paki Bonner saved that penalty in the World Cup. I remember I was in Clower Head in Louds for, for Michael Carew, 21 gold. I actually saw somebody log in there earlier called Paul McGrath. Uh, and Paul McGrath is the reason I support Aston Villa. But also that day in 1994, he was like, his background is amazing. And I loved his book. Uh, but he was facing um, Roberto Baggio, who was the best striker in the world at the time. And he... He, uh, he, had, he gave a man of the match performance and we won that game 1-0. Uh, so I was, I was seeing Irish, people's, Irish people succeed at the highest level, but also within my own county, Westmeath, which wouldn't be really known for football. But the 95 guys gave the whole county a, bo uh, a boost when they won the All-Ireland Championship. Um, and there's a couple of guys from my club, Cass Lady, Joe Casey was playing, and a first cousin of mine was playing. Uh, so I was in contact with people who were succeeding at the highest level. Uh, and then, of course, I, I live in the Westmead Offaly border and, and Vinnie Claffey used to come into the farm store and he was uh, one of the best footballers at the time for Offaly um, when they won the Leinster title. So, I believe it came through hard work, through teamwork, but also through your surroundings. You know, and you don't never really have to look too far to, uh, to take inspiration, especially nowadays. And I had a video there for just to show you about London, but I don't think we have much time, but... Um, and there, I suppose, guys, there are some of the things I think that helped me progress through my sporting career um, and still do to this day, you know, and the importance of engineering. I think you could use all of those points uh, for sure in any walk of life. Uh, and they would stand the test of time that if you started something and use these to help you out, I think you will go well. Um, and I just want to say thanks, guys, for having me along. I'm looking forward to, to listening to the more scientific approach that Paul is going to offer us now. So thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. That that was great, um, and it definitely brings us nicely into into the next part, uh, into the engineering part that that Paul will will uh, talk about. So hi guys, I'll just uh, share my screen really quickly. And let me know if you can hopefully see it. Yes, we can see it. Cool. Yeah, so so just to build on from everything that Mark was saying, so I suppose my PhD started as a direct result from himself and Owen, and um, a lot of our focus was um, using aerodynamics and like aerodynamics engineering as such to try and develop hand cycles and uh, tandem aerodynamics to, yeah, to improve performance at the end of the day. So just to give a quick overview, um, of what I'll be talking. So I'll just give a quick introduction to, I suppose, tandem and hand cycles, and then we'll go into them individually, one by one. But um, so with tandem cycling, you have two people on a single bike. So the person in the front is called a pilot, the person in the back is called a stalker. And where tandem cycling could get really exciting, if you think about it, you've, you've two, two athletes on a single bicycle, but their profile, their frontal profile as such, as they're cutting through the air, is almost that of a, a single cyclist. But you've, you've doubled the power, so they, they can cruise at speeds that, if you're on your own, you know, you're struggling to get there as such. Um, hand cycling then, for, um, as Mark was saying, lower body amputees or paraplegics. And um, there's two types also, I suppose, as well. There's um, a recumbent type, as shown in the photo, where you're lying back, but there's also another type where you're in a more of a kneeling position as such. Um, so hand cycling is also, you can reach incredible speeds, especially like on a downhill descent, because it's quite stable relatively with three wheels. So 
with the speeds that you can reach in both tandem cycling and hand cycling when it's it's well above 50 kilometers an hour at times um aerodynamics can become the, the, the primary thing that's actually slowing you down from going any faster as such so little tiny little changes here and there can really make all the difference in just minor gains that can be the difference in, in winning or losing a race so just to further the introduction as well just on, a, on the technical side of things i suppose the questions we have to ask well what is aerodynamic drag and then in the context of the presentation today what is cfd and what is ccda um so just to start with aerodynamic drag first it's it's easier to understand or comprehend if you think about um water or liquids first i suppose if you imagine a boat traveling across water it has to move the water out of its way to be able to pass through and that water has a drag force on the boat itself which slows it down so um, it needs power to, to push through and that's the exact same for anybody so us ourselves if we're just like walking from one end of the room to the other end of the room we have to push the air out of the way and the faster we go the harder it is to push the air the more energy it takes as such so the energy or the, the power the force required um, as you go faster it's the, the velocity squared so it just it, it starts to increase exponentially almost so once you get above yeah, 50 kilometers an hour on a bicycle or a hand cycle, um, it's just, it's, it really, that's where all the energy that the, uh, the athlete is outputting is really just to overcome aerodynamics at that point. So the next question then, what is CFD? So CFD stands for computational fluid dynamics. It's where we're able to model air or any fluid on a computer. Normally, or what was like the traditional method would be that you go to a wind tunnel um, and you put the bicycle or the athlete or both in the tunnel and you're blowing air at it. And from there, from that, you can measure the, the force that the air has on the object. And we're essentially able to do the exact same thing, but now on a computer where we solve um, basically our fluid flow equations and we're able to get the end result, which is the force of the air on the athlete or the bicycle. CDA then is a non-dimensional term um, for force. So a CDA is essentially the, the amount of force, non-dimensionalized, non that the athlete or the bicycle is experiencing. And you can use it as a, a reference or as a benchmark or to compare to setups or to bicycles or even to athletes. So you can know roughly which one is better in the same condition. So just to talk about tandem cycling then, um, from an engineering perspective, you can look at it and say, okay, you know, what can we improve? We, you know, we, we want to go faster. We want to be able to cut through the air faster you know, what do we have to work with? And fundamentally, there's three systems that we have. We have the bicycle itself. You could redesign the bicycle, have different, a different frame, different wheels. You've the athletes themselves, the positions that they're in, that they're in, their, their torso, torso angles, where their arms are, and the position relative to each other. And then you also have the equipment that they're wearing, which would be uh, the helmets, the skin suits, shoes, even socks, gloves. Um, they can all play a role. So if you if you already have, you know, let's say athletes and you have two athletes, you have the bicycle, you have the equipment um, that already narrows down some things. If you already have the bicycle and you can't afford to maybe get a new bicycle or to do testing there, you can start working with just, you know, their torso angles, their positions straight away for no cost. And you can really start to make some serious improvements here. Um, as, you know, you don't, with no extra cost, you don't have to actually buy anything as such. So that was one of the first things that we started focusing on in the research, because if you have two athletes, you have a lot of variability. Even if you only have a single athlete on a single bicycle, there's a lot of variability in terms of, you know, where they can move, where, you know, the position they can put their body into, and then how to repeatedly do that also, so that the athlete will go into the same position every time. And this is something that's very difficult to do in the wind tunnel sometimes, or on the track, to get that exact replication between each and every experiment. So this is where CFD, by doing it on a computer, had huge advantages because we're able to have a fixed position and then we're able to move it exactly to the position that we want to move it. So we can move the arms or the body or the head, we can change angles, you know, we can see, and then we can see the direct impact of just that one change that we're making. So in this particular ex example that I have on screen, we're just looking at torso angle. And even just with the torso angle, you have a lot of combinations because you've got the pilot in the front and the stoker in the back. So which combination is it that gives you maybe the best performance? Um, maybe if the pilot has a slightly larger torso angle, you might shield the stoker behind them from some of the air. 
um, or maybe vice versa, or maybe they both need to get as low as possible. Um, so we could start iterating here quite easily and do an optimization study of sorts. And to give a kind of a broad overview of what this looks like then on a fluid flow level, um, if we look at the very top left of this um, image here, so we have 2020, which is both um, athletes have a torso angle of 20 degrees. In front of the, the pilot, the very front, it's all red. So this is a high pressure region. And behind them then it's all blue, which is a low pressure region. Essentially what the image is telling us is that the, the athlete in the front, the pilot, he's the person who's blocking all of the air and has to move it around them. And the person behind him, the stoker, only has a small high pressure region just on the helmet. Um, so that's already starting to give us a lot of information. Um, so we started to think, okay, if we move the, the pilot up ever so slightly, maybe that'll reduce some of the pressure on the stoker behind him, but maybe it won't, it, it won't increase the pressure on the, the pilot himself, that it'll, you know, there'll be a trade-off there as such. Um, so we started looking at all of these different combinations to try and figure out what one is the best. And for this particular case with these athletes, it was if the pilot was at an angle of 25 degrees and then the stoker behind was at an angle of 20 degrees. Um, this could also, because of yeah, the different equipment and the, the different options you could have, it can be very case dependent on the athletes that you have as well. Um, so this gives a rough idea or a rough view that you know any team can look at and say, okay, this is you know roughly where optimal the optimal position might be. But there's also a lot more gains that you could that, you know you could have by investigating more yourself with the people that you have. So what we also looked at was then yeah, time trial uh, versus road race, and also we tried to model. Um, athletes, the same athlete, but just on a solo bike, to try and get more of an understanding of you know the fluid flow, what's happening, where the air is going, how the the pilot you know affects the the stoker behind, and equally how the stoker affects the aerodynamics of the pilot ahead. And um, there's a lot of interesting um, findings that we had here. One of which was that if you have tandem athletes, if the stoker, the person on the back, doesn't actually use the the handlebars, if they just um, hold onto the frame in front of them instead. Um, they're, they're taking their arms out of the floor quite a bit, and that actually um, makes them just that little bit quicker. So the numbers I have here was um, 8.1 seconds over a 10 kilometer race, which is absolutely huge for just a simple change in position of their arms. There are other things to consider here then as well, as in how comfortable that might be if the athlete can hold that position for such a long period of time. Um, you know, there's, so there's also other factors, but um, we can already, you know, see just from changing a position, the difference that that might have on um, on a race. So moving on to hand cycling, hand cycling then was something that was um, altogether something different when we were trying to optimize for aerodynamics. Where for like regular solo cycling or tandem cycling, you've got you know very specific bodies. You've you know you have a person in the front, you have a person in the rear, and you have the bicycle. The athlete on the hand cycle is a lot more integrated, you know, with the hand cycle itself as well. So, and there's a lot of interactions. You have the, the athletes at the same level of the wheels. And so the wheel aerodynamics come into play. The frame is interacting with the person a lot more. Um, and it's just, a, it's a slightly more complex system overall. There's a huge, like, um, it, there's a huge number of areas that you could optimize. And it's yeah, it was, it was ex very exciting in so many ways of you know what you could do here. Um, so starting out with just simple studies, then one of the first things that we started to look at was okay, wheels. You know, with three wheels, and we already know the wheels are you know very important for aerodynamics for cycling. And it was if you go to any bicycle shop, um, you see all the different variations that you can have, um, especially like with spoked wheels, you can have shallow shallow rims, deep rims. Um, all kinds of shapes on the spokes themselves. They can be bladed, they can be uh, cylindrical. Um, so there's a lot to play with here and a lot of things to, to study essentially. Um, so one of the first things that we wanted to study was, okay, you know, we have disc wheels and we have spoked wheels and let's just do, you know, okay, it is, is it the best thing to have, you know, all disc wheels? That was kind of the prevailing thought at the time. You know, if you take a single disc wheel and compare it to a single spoked wheel, the disc wheel generally, you know, wins out in terms of aerodynamics. Although nowadays you do have some very advanced uh, designs for spoke wheels coming out as well. But back then, the, yeah, the prevailing thought was if you have any, you know, a single disc wheel, it's generally better than a spoke wheel. 
So we looked at two different types of wheels. So the zip sub nine disc wheel and then zip 404 uh, spoke wheel. And uh, we just looked at different combinations. Um, so we looked at you know, all disc wheels, all spoke wheels, and then a combination of both, you know, two disc wheels in the back and a spoke in the front, or a disc wheel in the front and a spoke wheel, spoke wheels at the back. And if you can remember from the videos that Mark showed earlier, in one of his videos, he had a spoke wheel in front and then two disc wheels at the rear. And that, at the time, um, I remember talking to different people back then, and there was this, this thought that if you have the two disc wheels at the rear, they're a little bit more exposed to the flow than the front wheel, because the front wheel has the legs close by, it's got some of the frame, the chain guard, there's a lot of other geometry interacting with it there, but the two wheels in the back are a little bit um, you know, separated from the frame, there can be maybe a little bit more exposed to the flow. And um, what we found was, was actually that the, the opposite is actually true in terms of um, what actually works in terms of aerodynamics. If you have a disc wheel at the front and then spoke wheels at the rear, that gave us the best overall combination. And it's a little bit counterintuitive to think about it at first because you think, but well, hang on, you know, if I have disc wheels um, and, you know, they're like a little bit separated from, from the body, they're, you know, a little bit exposed to the free air, um, you know, why would they not be better than, than spoke wheels? And the answer was, was that they're, they're two wheels, but they're in parallel and they're still relatively close to each other. And what happens is you have a low pressure region that is generated between the two wheels. And this low pressure region is directly behind the body of the athlete and the rest of the bicycle frame as well. And that essentially acts as a suction force pulling the athlete backwards. Whereas if you have spoke wheels, you don't get that same uh, low pressure region because they're essentially porous. You know, it's, you have a lot of open air, the air can flow through the wheel itself because it's just spokes. It's not a, a solid surface as such. Um, so that was a very, very interesting finding that having, you know, well, theoretically, you'd say, okay, you know, on its own, that one disc wheel is better, but two of them together in parallel is actually slightly worse than, than having spoked wheels. Of course, it depends on the spoked wheels as well, or comparison to, were to very aerodynamic spoked wheels. If you took, just took a very standard wheel, then the opposite would be true. The, the, the disc wheels would probably win out. So we were comparing them to, you know, the better end of the scale in terms of what you can get for, for spoked wheels. So that was just, it was, yeah, a very kind of interesting finding that kind of threw a couple of things, you know, on its, on its head in terms of what was thought of, you know, what traditionally might be the better combination to have. Um, other things that we were able to look at as well, just simple things like safety. If you have three disc wheels on the bike and you're going into a very strong crosswind, we were able to say that uh, you were, you know, up to six times more likely to, you know, roll the bike over than you were if you're using um, just standard uh, spoke wheels. So there's a lot of like, you know, um, easy analysis in, in some way you could say that we were able to do without having to change it all that much. We're just looking at the angle that the wind is hitting the bicycle at. The last thing that I kind of want to touch on then was just also body position as well for, for the athlete for hand cycling. You know, you, it's what, what can you change? What can you do to, you know, just change the position so that the athlete himself, so that the overall system you know, ha has a lower drag as such. So one thing that we were looking at was if you're in a hand cycle and you're doing a hill descent, sometimes you can go faster than you can actually, you know, you can't cycle beyond that speed. So you, you just let yourself roll as such. And at that point, you're holding the cranks, but where do you put them? You know, where do you put your arms? Do you hold them down? Do you hold them out? You know, what, what position as such, you know, might give you the most optimal gain. And these are really, really tiny gains that we're, we're talking about here. Um, but just that tiny gain might make the difference between winning or losing. So something else that we're able to look at then with CFD, we're able to look at, we just looked at four standard positions and we just call them the positions by clock positions, 12 o'clock up to the very top, three o'clock, which would be um, in towards the body, six o'clock down vertical, and then nine o'clock would be outreached as such. And typically what we saw before in races would be that it would be in the six o'clock position. That was the most common position that we saw. Um, but we found that if you outstretch your arms, it actually gives you a slightly better result. The reason being is that your arm isn't so, it's not as exposed to the flow as such, it's a little bit more streamlined, it's out in a straight line, rather than your whole elbow region being a little bit more exposed to the flow. And it's very small gains that you're talking about. So here we looked, it was like 0.8 seconds over 500 meter descent. And actually you might think the number 0.8 seconds is small, but in terms of a race, that's actually a huge number. Um, and again, you could optimize this further because we just looked at, you know, 
just the, the standard position, you know, nine o'clock straight out. But maybe if you lowered it slightly or raised it very slightly, you might be able to make small little gains here or there as well. That also might be unique to a particular athlete, depending on, you know, everybody's body is a different shape as such. Um, so again, it's just kind of easy changes that you can make that will, you know, give you more time on the track, um, give you a better chance. So that's the end of my, my presentation. Hopefully I didn't go too far over time. And um, yeah, any questions, I suppose, um, and myself and Mark would be uh, happy to, to answer. Thanks very much, uh, Paul. Very interesting. I'd say every everyone who is really into cycling would love to have a model done of themselves and checked all the positions and everything. Um, I wonder, Mark, did you learn anything now, how you should change your position or change your wheels on the hand cycle? I think I, I think I have an excuse to buy a new bike, Magda. Very good. <laughs> Always good excuse. I present I present the Paul's findings to uh, to convince the powers that be. Brilliant. Um, just um, Mark, you know you uh, you discussed uh, before about you know how was paracycling in Ireland uh, when you started, or how was hand cycling in Ireland, and that there were only two people hand cycling when you when you got into into the paracycling scene. Um, just wondering, uh, you know, how much did the paracycling change uh, in Ireland since then, you know, in terms of the setup for athletes, in terms of equipment, training, regime, you know, those kind of things? Well, I, I went from um, knowing nothing, absolutely nothing, at a World Championships in 2010 to being, like, with, with the work that, that Paul has, has put, put, put in there and... and Cycling Ireland and all the other um, support staff to one of the world leaders in ten years, which is pretty incredible, to be honest. Uh, and I even talking to to, um, to give a real life example of of uh, how important 0.8 seconds can be. I know that some of the guys are competing at the weekend, and because of the condensed season, it's selection for Tokyo, uh, which will be happening over World Cups and races. And the difference between 12th and third at a hand cycle race at the weekend was three seconds. So, so that's you going to Tokyo after four years' work and you're not going to Tokyo. Um, so every second counts. And, and to, to be lucky enough to have people um, in your corner and people developing this information for you is... is um, as an athlete, it gives you great confidence to work hard, to motivate yourself, to know that, okay, I'm doing everything I can, but actually so are people who aren't actually as invested in the direct, uh, my direct path, but to know that people are out there being world leaders, it, it kind of, you puff out your chest a bit. You think, okay, well, now I have to uphold, I have to uphold my end of the bargain as well. So it's a really, it's a two-way street, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very interesting. You know, there are just such a small margins that, you know, definitely, you know, the, the tens of seconds that Paul mentioned there in terms of changing the, the, the position of your arms or changing the wheels, you know, that will make the difference. And like, if you were to go back, come back from your retirement now and rejoin the, you know, hand cycling scene, what changes would you make to your setup, you know, to your bike, you know, you, I know you mentioned before that carbon cover on for your feet, but what other changes would you make to your bike or what, what, what would be the difference now if you were to come in now, well, as it, opposed to, you know, when you retired in 2015? Uh, even since Paul's work in 2018, uh, the UCI have, so this is the really frustrating thing about cycling and UCI, um, that, it's still early days in Paris, so they're standardized, standardizing everything. And the most powerful countries have a lot of say. So now, as of next year, every bike has to have 20 inch wheels on the back. So Paul's test of my bike at the moment, actually my bike is okay, because I, I got it for World Championships in Switzerland, because tactically it's suited the race, but anybody who's got a, a bike with 26 inch wheels on the back cannot compete at a UCI sanctioned race next year. So if Paul wants to repeat uh, another PhD, I think he has a, he could do the same work with, I, I don't know, Paul, would, would there be much work involved changing the, the rear wheels 
because the frame, the frame drops, the, the frame shortens, yeah. the bike becomes stiffer. It's, it's it's a whole new bike, I suppose. Yeah, that was something that we looked at as well, actually. Which is, and the, the, the funny thing was, was that if you do have 20 inch wheels on the rear, it improves the aerodynamic setup completely altogether. Um, like you could almost universally apply that to any bike, any hand cycle, if you have the, the smaller 20 inch on the, on the rear and 120, 26 inch in the front, it does improve things straight away. And then it also adds the other question that, because what I was talking before about was, you know, having discs on the, the rear or spokes, spokes in the rear. But then if you have smaller wheels, do you have that same under pressure, pressure region developed and will you have the same effect? And so there's, there's so many questions left to answer there as well. But um, the, the one thing that we just did check briefly was, yeah, smaller wheels, they do definitely have it in terms of aerodynamics. And that, because, because for me, the, 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 if I had spoken to old mechanics, the, the, the thinking was the smaller wheels don't roll as well, uh, which, I, I, which I suppose, you know, the, how do you argue that? You know, how, how do you, how, you wouldn't know how to prove that, but um, if you could then counter argue with the, with the aerodynamic benefit, then you could convince a lot of people of what materials uh, you, should, you could be using, because at the top level, you know, that's what it comes to. Great. I can see there is a question from Owen. Uh, Owen, uh, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Hi, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Mark and uh, Paul, for the talk. Uh, very interesting. And um, I, maybe if I could just ask uh, two, well, one question each. Uh, so, Mark, one, one of the things I noticed when I suppose one of the first times I would have met you would have been at the World Championships in Greenville in the States. Uh, when I was uh, staying with you over there, we were uh, rooming together and uh, you were much more professional as an athlete than I was. Uh, you know, I tended to go out and hammer myself training and kind of, you know, not, uh, I suppose, look after the other aspects. But I suppose my question from that point of view is now that you're coaching, if you were to look back at the, the athlete that you were, and I'm not talking about equipment or anything, but just other issues such as, you know, training, rest, nutrition, what do you know now that maybe you think would be would improve things? Uh, I suppose you know compared to the athlete that you were. And uh, from for Paul, I was I was also wondering as well. I mean, one of the things, obviously, I know your the work you did quite well, but I was just wondering what are your own kind of thoughts on the best way to maybe link the CFD modeling, which is obviously very computationally intensive, etc., with the I suppose the kind of real world dynamics that can occur in a bike in bike racing, things like you know crosswinds and uh, the the overall movement of a peloton, etc. And you know how far are we away from being able to kind of seriously tackle those real world conditions? All right, so uh, I would say and it's good to hear from you, and I'll never forget those days of uh, of Greenville. That was a really good trip. But uh, I would say the, the so the the, the know-how has, has has developed and the software has developed uh, that at the time a lot of a lot of our training would be above, would be below you know just endurance and then below threshold and above threshold and, you know once you go above threshold it was very non-specific it's just you go above threshold uh, but now I, I use the so I use training peaks to communicate with my with my athletes. We also use a software called WK05, which is partnered with Training Peaks. I don't know if you know it, but that breaks down another couple of zones past threshold. So I know exactly um, if I'm doing sprint work, uh, they have a model developed called functional reserve capacity. So they, they can tell when you analyze the, uh, the training file, I can tell if five or six or seven sprints, if, if, I, if you're doing 40 seconds on, 20 seconds off, I can tell if you've discharge the battery enough, but you're getting enough for training effect. And then if you've recovered enough for the next set of intervals. Um, and that just means you're, you're hitting the sweet spot more often uh, in a condensed training session, or uh, it would definitely play a part in race tactics because uh, like, a, for example, crit racing is one hour hard, you know, accelerate out of corners, close a gap or try and break a gap. So you could specifically look at it gives you a breakdown of your watts. There's a power duration curve that tells you what's at one minute, what's at 120, what's at 140, what's it. And as you feed information into that software, it spits, it recalculates and spits it back out. So 
that's the big difference that I would I would say that has happened in the last four or five years. Um, that would impact my training now is I compare it to what I did uh, to what I would do now. So just on, on my end, it's a very it's a tough question to answer. In, it's it's both an easy and a tough question to answer. I suppose the easy answer is that if you have if you have unlimited money and unlimited resources, it's one hundred percent possible to kind of um, go into the detail that you want. If you compare it to let's say what is done on a day to day basis on like in the airspace or in the automotive industry, um, they wouldn't bat an eyelid at it. But then if you you know if you took those costs and you know came down to the cycling level and said, well, this is what we need to do. Um, it's a it's a very scary thought and how much that actually costs to do. Um, in, in terms of like what's possible to do with the software, it, it is it is technically possible to to you know look into things in so much more detail than it was possible even you know three four or five years ago. Um, in you know moving components, having you know looking at a full peloton, maybe a single person moving through the peloton, you might have like realistic wind conditions, not just, you know, wind tunnel conditions as such, um, you know, having surface roughness models and all these, there's, there's so many things that you can, you know, build in. Um, it's the, the expense side to it is why I think it might happen quite as soon as we would like it to happen, maybe. But it's 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 95% possible to do it, definitely. Thanks, Paul. Um, there is a question from Derek, uh, about uh, about cycling gear, did you do any investigation in the area of helmets, jersey, shorts, shoes? You know, looking at the equipment, how that impacts the uh, the aerodynamics of of a cyclist. Um, yeah, we did. That was a, so that was a huge focus of what we did in the the wind tunnel as well. So we did a little bit of of CFD on, on helmets, um, but in the actual physical wind tunnel, that's where we started looking into. Yeah, you know everything that the athletes are wearing down to down to just the, the gloves that they might be wearing, and it's, it's so surprising to think that you know just gloves and socks and they, they were already making a difference. Um, so yeah, we did um, our own bit of research on that side of things as well. Great, thanks. And there is a question from Mary uh, who would like to know more about how to build one's inner resilience that Mark referred to in his presentation. Uh, how to build inner resilience? Um, I would say courage. You know, you have to be prepared, prepared to fail, and 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 accepting that failing is uh, part of the process. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, you can use the word fail. It's just it's just part of the process that you have to go through. Um, and I think I think through um, attempting you know new things, you build inner resilience. And then even asking the question, Mary is. Is is uh, is showing some courage, and because you want to know more, so you're showing an appetite for for um, an, an appetite for information on how to improve that area. And it's just it's just like any other muscle or uh, part of the body that you want to improve. You have to work on it, you know. Um, and then there's so many things now that you can draw inspiration from, whether it's on YouTube or meditation or stretching or or um, just. Be you know like being grateful, like uh, like one thing I do every morning is I, I make coffee, uh, and of course during lockdown I, I got a grinder and I am a tea I'm I'm a tea guy, always was, and I got a coffee grinder and I start buying some nice coffee, uh, and and then every morning when I make when I grind the coffee I just smell it, and it's such um just triggers me to say okay I'm actually grateful, I can smell the coffee. Uh, and it's, it creates some sort of sensation or chemicals in your brain. And I know, okay, another day here, and I'm lucky and uh, humbled to, to have another day. I know that sounds a bit serious, but honestly, that's what I do every morning. When I smell that, I know that um, you know, you're in a good position. Things are good. Uh, the really good tips there, Mark. I really appreciate it. Absolutely inspirational stuff today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice to meet you. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, that's that's really important. You know, every little thing matters. Every little moment, that's what's making our life. So, so it's a great, it's a, it's a great, great comment. Um, I'm conscious of time, but I just have one last question uh, for Paul. Uh, just in terms of, you know, because you're a graduate of NUI Galway, I know that you were involved uh, in your undergraduate degree in Galway Energy Efficient Car, and I can see 
from the participant list that some people uh, who are also involved in GIG are here today. So, uh, you know, just uh, how did the experience of your undergraduate degree and how your experience of, you know, choosing the path for your PhD, where you kind of focus on a really specific area of cycling aerodynamic or paracycling aerodynamics, how did that influence your, you know, your further career, you know, what you're doing now, uh, you know, how, how did this set you up for the future as an engineer or for the future as a professional? Yeah, that's um, a difficult question. I suppose the for, for going into the PhD in the first place, I think with that, well, like the, the work that I did um, on, the, on the Geek under Nathan Quinlan, um, I wouldn't have been able to do the PhD without that. That's that the the work that we did there as an undergrad. That's that the you know the framework and the you know the foundation that you know the foundational knowledge needed to move to use CFD and you know use it for something else and, and keep developing as such. So that was that was really key just being able to. To, you know have that knowledge just to do the PhD in the first place and then in the PhD then um, I suppose you know this focused very much on you know cycling aerodynamics but using CFD as such and like now I'm in like the kind of the automotive air, airspace side of things and might relate you know okay you've got a bicycle and you've got an airplane in the car and you know as in why, why, why would I be hired for the job where somebody else might have maybe studied you know, specifically automotive engineering or something like that but um, it's the skill set behind it really that was so important. The ability to you know use CFD, but also not so much even use the CFD as the ability to think critically and not take something for face value. I think that was one of the most like valuable things I learned from, from the PhD and what I've been maybe using the most since I've started working. You know, you 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 start to be approached you know for different things because you might think differently. About you know what's actually going on, you might look at it in a certain different in a different way rather than just you know trying to I, I don't know tackle it in whatever other way you might be able to tackle it I suppose. Um, so that was I think that was yeah one of the key things that I suppose you know you know the at least when I was going for my current job, you know the question really wasn't so much on you know upcycling aerodynamics. It was more so you know oh you'll be able to be able to approach a problem in this way and you know you still have that fundamental knowledge on what CFD is that you can you can learn what you need to tackle on the other problem but you have that fundamental base for you know what you can do going forward um so that was I suppose that, that was how all three might be interlinked as such but um yeah it's, it definitely all started with the, the geek back in the day that was the where you know the interest in aerodynamics and CFD and then it all grew from there brilliant Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark and Paul, for, uh, you know, it was a great pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, you know, I, it's very interesting, great perspectives and great discussion. Um, and thank you very much to all who attended today. And I hope you enjoyed it uh, as much as I did.